um, just according to their own accounts, the, the Eclectic Materia Medica originated through whatever they could get their hands on that they felt was reliable medicine. And so it's a mix, as they always said it was, of American folk remedies, of remedies that um, appeared in the American botanical magazines from 1825 onward. They were picked up where American botanical remedies were picked up by doctors and used. Sometimes doctors of other schools, sometimes just folk medicines. They um, borrowed a lot or owed a lot and admitted it to um, Raffinesque. And in fact, they considered Raffinesque, who wrote um, American Medical Botany, about first volume 1828, second volume 1830. And they considered him to be one of their forefathers because he. Um, they were trying to be scientific, and he was a scientist of sorts. What Raffinesque did, he was an explorer and discoverer. He liked to go out and investigate in the wilderness, identify new plants, uh, name them, learn from Native Americans their uses, and then uh, apply some of his own experiments and ex experiences uh, and publish books on the issue, and considered himself quite the authority, and uh, established himself as such, aside from the fact that Classically trained botanists were often in conflict with his opinion uh, regarding some of the classification of plants. And so he was a bit of a renegade, which is typical uh, as many people in alternative uh, medicine. But at the same time, he contributed greatly to the eclectic movement by acknowledging that style of practice as being appropriate. And the important aspect of eclectic medicine that really distinguished them from the other schools was the incorporation of Native American plants into medical practice. And so Raffinesque fed into that with his investigations and discoveries, and he approved of uh, the eclectics. He ultimately got into trouble for, I believe, practicing medicine without a license because he didn't have actual training as a doctor and yet uh, published some books on, on the subject and practiced as such. So in the end, I think he came into conflict with some of the people that he maybe could have worked well with if he hadn't have been quite so adamantly independent. And he was the first person to propose a number of things, like that the American Indians had come across the Bering Straits. He was the first person to do a medical botany of the Ohio Valley and the area beyond, beyond the Appalachian Mountains. Well, to do a medical botany, yeah. And uh, he introduced even the name eclectic, or defined it, and apparently they may have picked it up from there, from that source. So they learned a lot from him and, and the journals that came afterwards. Then they um, also adopted the kind of mm, major allopathic remedies too, especially the botanical ones and even some of the chemical ones. And so things like aconite, belladonna, gelsimium that came out of, kind of out of allopathy, although some of those also came from homeopathy. And uh, they didn't rummage, I originally thought that they read a lot in uh, um, the homeopathic Materia Medica, but little by little I realized that um, the borrowings between homeopathy and the eclectics date to a later time. It was actually in the 1860s that uh, Dr. Scudder, Dr. John Scudder, who revised the whole system of eclectic practice that he put together, the Eclectic Materia Medica, called the Specific Materia Medica, or Specific Medication, based on this, this idea of specific indications. What happened with Scudder um, and the whole system of specific medication was the emphasis of choosing the one single remedy which most appropriately addressed the constellation of symptoms or signs as expressed by the patients, as opposed to these elixirs which were general tonic formulas sold, you know, they're going to cure everybody, a panacea effect, or the physiomedicalist approach of using a lot of herbs in a specialized individual formula, combination of many herbs, uh, according to the belief of the eclectics, and it's difficult to argue with, that each herb in itself is a formula. It's a combination of many bioactive components and that that's adequate in treating most conditions. So when they did uh, 
prescribe combinations of herbs. They're usually uh, very simple combinations using a few herbs, but the standard of practice was uh, similar to homeopathy, using one botanical extract in relatively small, frequently repeated doses uh, from fresh plant extracts on the basis of certain uh, indicating uh, signs, physical manifestations that would lead you to that remedy. And, and those signs were often based upon the pulse or the appearance of the tongue or the eyes, all of which were obviously borrowed from his readings about Chinese medicine, even though, again, he didn't borrow directly, but he took the concept that these are important uh, signs to look at and observe and see how that matched with appropriate remedies. And so he developed this system, and at first he met a lot of opposition within the profession, but ultimately over a period of decades it, it grew to be generally accepted, at least within the Midwest. He and John King find this young chemist who they're very, very interested in. Even though he has no real formal training, he's apprenticed uh, for quite a few years, but he has no uh, university education, and this guy's name is John Uri Lloyd. And they tell him, they said, look, if you're going to work with us, you're going to be tarred by the odium of eclecticism. The, you know, in the sense that you're going to, everybody's going to not want to deal with you who's allopathic because you're working with us. And Lloyd says he doesn't really care. He, he, he has great respect for Scudder. He has great respect for King. And they set out to create the greatest herbal medicines that have ever been made and maybe succeeded. They call these specific medicines. In 1870, Scudder publishes his monumental work called Specific Medication, setting out the new theory of eclectic medicine. Before that, eclecticism was that, just that, it was eclectic. The best of wherever, whatever you had. So they took from homeopathy, they took from you know, botanical medicine, from the Thomsonians, from the physiomedicalists, from allopathic medicine, whatever worked, at, and the, was the be, as far as they're concerned, was the best, that was what they used. So now for the first time, there is now a unified theory of eclectic medicine. And the idea is to explore the Materia Medica, especially the American Materia Medica, but not entirely, and to find out what they call the black letter symptoms, the specific symptom pictures that allow you to understand exactly where a given herb is appropriate for a given patient. They even go as far to basically create labels for their specific medicines that Lloyd makes. And Lloyd originally is part of a company called Lloyd and Thorpe. And then it's Lloyd, uh, actually I think he works with Merrill first, and then Lloyd and Thorpe, and then it becomes Lloyd Brothers. They patent the labels. So nobody else can duplicate the medicines. If you see this label, you know it's a real medicine that has real activity. Now, one of the theories of eclectic medicine that's kind of interesting, because most people who know anything about eclectic medicine, the theory of specific medication was you used the specific medicine. So you're talking about simpling. You're talking about using a specific herb at a given time. That is the theory of specific medication. The reality of specific medication was is that most people did not necessarily do that. Either they would alternate herbs, meaning one hour you'd give this herb, the next hour that one, and then back to the first herb. So you'd either alternate herbs, meaning you're using more than one, but you may be alternating them. But what also would happen is there were many specific, excuse me, there were many classic eclectic medications from the old days of eclecticism, which people still had great faith in and still worked, which they continued using. And what you also find in the eclectic practices, even though Scudder's theory lays it out as you use one herb at a time, most eclectic practitioners actually use simple formulas of three or f it's anywhere from two to four herbs at a time. So the idea, even though the idea was to use this herb or that herb at a given moment, they were actually combining them. In some of the later books, you actually see quite a bit of this sort of combination of these simple formulas, usually with maybe three, three ingredients per formula. So that's where specific medication comes from. And then several years after his book, Specific Medication, he follows that up with his book, Specific Diagnosis, which I think comes out in 1872. And specific diagnosis is the diagnostic symptoms because Scudder creates a whole system of tongue and pulse diagnosis, um, very different than, say, Chinese or Ayurvedic tongue and pulse diagnosis. 
In Chinese medicine, the pulses tell you if you have a bounding pulse, it's an excess pulse. If you have a, a certain tongue signs, it shows deficiency or excess or heat or cold or stagnation. Where scutters, tongue signs and pulse signs indicate specific remedies. So there was the belladonna pulse and the aconite pulse and there was the copper sulfate tongue. And so you, ha you have a very different system, but it comes as close to creating a true American system of medicine, meaning there's a whole uh, theoretical framework with diagnostics. It's a system of medicine. And specific medica med medicine was, public, uh, was practiced from about 1870, and it continued to be practiced up until the 1930s at the very least. So in the Eclectic Materia Medica, you might see something like uh, Dr. Scudder talking about Oregon grape root, I think it is. And he says, so we use it in small doses, like one drop, and we use it with equal pleasure in large doses, <laughs> like a tables, tablespoonful or something. So um, he himself did introduce the use of small amounts because when you're using, well, first of all, with things like aconite, belladonna, gel, so I mean, you have to use very small amounts, a couple drops. Some of these 10 drops could kill you, you know? And those aren't the only ones. Baptisia, somewhat toxic, that was used for typhoid fever. Um, Chelidonium, this old European liver remedy that was introduced into North America too. And the Indians picked that up as well. Um, so there were some limits there, but they would, if you look under, say, John William Fife's uh, Materia Medica under Vitex or Chaseberry, he lists the dose as 1 to 60 drops. <laughs> so they were quite open to a wide variety and a wide selection. And so Scudder introduced these small dosages, maybe 1 to 10 drops for a lot of remedies. And um, now the older eclectics rebelled against him at first, but Scudder said, no, no, we're not trying to oppose anybody. You use what works for you. If you want compounds, if you want specific medicines too, were often used singly or maybe two or three together, but, but they were not compounded. They were not five or six, seven, 10, 15 remedies all together into a compound. They were, they were just a few specifics used, one or two or three together. For instance, say if there was a lot of menstrual bleeding, there'd be maybe something that was a cramp remedy plus something that's a blood tonic or something like that, like some iron tonic or something. So they might, you know, address a couple interrelated remedies, but they would be um, used singly um, or put together in very simple formulas of two to three herbs. And um, uh, so also that's another aspect of specific medicine to use the single herb like that and to understand it singly and to compound to kind of at a minimum. And if you are compounding, you're using plants that you understand their action pretty well, and you're using them because they work together well. Over here, we have one of my favorite medicines. This is Collinsonia. The Latin name is Collinsonia canadensis. Now, in the eclectic literature, and this is very much an eclectic plant, uh, in the eclectic literature, they talk very much about the fact that good colonsonia needs to be made from the fresh root, the fresh leaf, and flower. And these aren't flowering yet. Unfortunately, in the commercial marketplace, most of the medicines made from colonsonia are made from the dry root. But all of the flavonoids and all of the volatile oils are in the flowers and the leaves. And so colonsonia makes a great medicine. It should be what's called aromatic colonsonia, made from the whole fresh flowering plant, root leaf, stem, flower. And this is a wonderful medicine. And the black letter symptoms, the specific indications would be basically venous congestion with stasis and laxity of tissue. So for instance, we use it for benign prostatic hyperplasia in men. We use it for what's called minister's throat, a chronic low-grade uh, irritation of the vocal cords. We use it for things like var varicose veins. We use it for hemorrhoids. And it is a wonderful medicine that can be taken to help tonify tissue, to reduce laxity, to help uh, increase circulation to the tissue.
Here we have yellow dock, Rumex crispus. And yellow dock is an introduced plant, uh, came with the Europeans, and the part used is the root. The root does have a nice yellow color, hence the name yellow dock. Um, yellow dock traditionally was used by the eclectics for cachexia associated with cancer, the wasting associated with cancer. It's also used for dry coughs, and then another black letter symptom for yellow dock is skin conditions that are oozing, weeping with a serous discharge or a pussy discharge. So it doesn't matter what you call the condition. You can call it nonspecific dermatitis, eczema, psoriasis. If it has an oozing discharge, you want to use Rumex. You can use it topically, and you can also use it internally as a tea or as a tincture. The black letter symptoms for Baptisia, wild indigo, is tissue that looks and smells like rotting meat. So when you have somebody with um, a really severe putrid sore throat with pus sacs on the tonsils, and they open their mouth and you can smell the rotting flesh before you actually even look down their throat. You have somebody with something like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, where there's literally pieces of the bowel in, in when, you, when the person goes to the bathroom. The other side of that indication is also tissue that has a dusky leaden hue. What are they talking about? They're about tissue that is literally starved for oxygen and the tissue is breaking down. And so it's traditionally used not only for things like that and really severe um, um, ulceration of the cervix, um, really bad um, periodontal disease where the gums are really drawn back and they become spongy and they're bleeding and the, the, the breath is just horrendous, uh, severe bacterial or fungal sinusitis, but also used for septicemia. And actually, I can tell you honestly, clinically, it, it works, especially if you catch it early. Um, and it was often combined with herbs like echinacea, which actually has somewhat of a similar black letter symptom. So that's one example. Another example of a black letter symptom would be the herb, um, well, two herbs that have a fairly specific, uh, similar black letter symptom. One is ulnus, ulnus seriolata, uh, tag alder bark, and the other one is mahonia, uh, which the eclectics call uh, Berber's aquifolium, but it's mahonia aquifolium now, which is Oregon grapefruit. And both of those herbs are used for things like psoriasis, eczema, especially if, it had, if it's red. But the specific indications are for large red pimples on the back, neck, and buttocks called comedones that never come to a head. And these herbs are used both topically, and you don't need both, one or the other, topically and orally to treat that also for acne rosacea. So that's another example of a black letter symptom. A third example would be the herb uh, sarsaparilla, Smilax, which is used specifically for tissue uh, can be any kind of tissue, mucous membrane tissue, muscle tissue, fascia, that is red, hot to the touch, and inflamed. So anything from rheumatoid arthritis to psoriatic arthritis to inflammatory bowel disease, you're going to use this to help reduce the inflammation in the tissue.